Hi, I'm Duncan and I'm going to be giving a talk on sanctification. Sanctification is quite a long subject, so I'm going to be talking quite fast to fit it into as short a time as possible. If you want to read the scriptures, just pause the video to read them, but I'm not going to be reading them out loud just to save time. So sanctification, the most popular definition of sanctification is becoming more Christ-like. And that comes from this scripture, and we all are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. But the word sanctification actually comes from two Latin words, sanctus, which means holy, and fieca, which means make. So to put it simply, to sanctify literally means to make holy. Let's look at the origins and reasons for sanctification. Sanctification is about restoration, restoring us to what we were originally created to be, restoring God's temple and his presence with us and restoring us for God's use. In the Garden of Eden, mankind walked in God's presence. But when sin entered, mankind was exiled out of the garden and therefore out of God's presence. God didn't publicly manifest his presence with people again until the book of Exodus. First, he spoke to Moses at the burning bush saying, take off your sandals for the place where you stand is holy ground. Then God restored his presence among the Israelites in the Ark of the Covenant, a gold covered box, which they carried with them for 40 years in the desert. When they camped, the Ark of the Covenant was placed in a tent called the Tabernacle, in the innermost section called the Holy of Holies. No one was allowed to enter except the high priest once a year. Then God told them they would need to change. Since God is so other from the world, the people associated with him would need to be others too. This is why God said to them, you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy and I have set you apart from the nations to be, be, to be my own. Here we can see that holiness means to be set apart, separate. Since sanctify means make holy, it means to become separate from the world and its contaminating influence. In the Bible, both the Hebrew word kadas and the Greek word hagiasmos are sanctification words. They convey approximately the same meaning of being set apart, purified, or consecrated, and consecrated means dedicated or obeying. But hagiasmos can refer to both a completed past action or a present process which is still being experienced. This concept of past and present is actually found in the Old Testament where sanctification came in two parts. The first required sacrificial blood or ceremonial laws to pay for sin which was carried out by the high priest once a year in the tabernacle. The second was a work of obedience or of keeping God's commandments. In the new covenant, there are three stages to our sanctification, past, present and future. Let's look at the first stage. The first stage is the sanctification of our spirit. We are made spiritually purified when we are born again because Jesus' work on the cross replaces the sacrificial blood and ceremonial laws in the Old Testament. So sanctification starts at the same time we are justified. There's a kind of overlap. Let me just read this out to you. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. They all happen at the same time. There's a kind of overlap. We're given a new spirit. This creates a new desire to obey and please God and avoid sin. This was promised hundreds of years before Jesus even came in Jeremiah. So we can't continue to sin as a habit because the power of that new life within us keeps us from yielding to a life of sin. We no longer have a dominant love of sin. This is why some new Christians say things like, I'm a completely different person. The second stage is sanctification in the present. 
Unlike our sanctified spirit, our spiritual bodies and minds don't instantly change. So although we have a new desire to obey God, we still have to choose to set ourselves apart from the world. The Apostle Paul tells us that as Christians, we should grow more and more in sanctification. It's a process. And it, it should be just as if, just like we previously grew more and more in sin. Paul uses the word slaves when he explains this. His point is that before we were saved, we were compelled to sin like slaves. We had no choice. As Christians, we should choose to increase in holiness in a similar way. And later in Romans, Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because we are to be transformed. The Greek word originally used here is metamorphoster. Here we can see that sanctification requires a moral transformation of our minds. In this context, brainwashing is actually a good thing. But to achieve this, we all have to engage in a battle for our minds because sin remains at work in us. Paul says that we are not to yield to it. The Holy Spirit's presence dwells within us, helping us to persevere and pursue greater holiness throughout our lives. God's Spirit dwells in every Christian. That's why Paul says your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you. In Acts 15, we're reminded that God has now chosen a people for himself from every nation, from the Gentiles, which means from non-Jews. Since Christians are a temple of the Holy Spirit, God is restoring his temple within us. This has been his plan since the fall in the Garden of Eden. James said, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written, after this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it. So now we, the church, are the temple of God. He dwells in us rather than in a tent or a building. And then there's st stage three, the future tense of sanctification. The third is the completion of the whole process as we receive new resurrection bodies when Jesus returns. This is called glorification. So the completion of our sanctification overlaps with glorification. In this graph by Wayne Gruden, you can see a jagged line is used, indicating that sanctification is not always one directional. And it's possible that little progress to holiness is made by some Christians due to things like poor teaching, laziness, disobedience, etc. Why don't you pause the video and just study it for a moment to see the whole layout of sanctification? Now that we have looked at the three stages of sanctification, it would be good to summarise the differences between sanctification and justification which is a video you would have seen previous to this one. Here's another helpful chart from Wayne Gruden. Again, pause the video and study it for a few moments. So, what should be our response and how should we cooperate with God in our daily lives for our sanctification? Number one, we follow Jesus's example of love, humility and obedience. Paul explains this in Philippians 2. And we submit and repent when our Father in heaven disciplines us. We walk by the Spirit and keep in step with the Spirit, as mentioned in Galatians 5. The New Living Translation uses the phrases guided and following the Spirit's leading, demonstrating that we need to listen to the Holy Spirit and be obedient. And when we walk in obedience with the Holy Spirit, we bear fruit, which is, obedient, uh, which is evidence of sanctification, which can be seen by others so that God can use us powerfully. Number four, we ask for baptism of the Holy Spirit, which fills us with the power to lead more holy lives. All Christians are temples of the Holy Spirit, but not all Christians are baptised in the Holy Spirit. 
If you haven't received baptism with the Holy Spirit or you don't know what that means, do ask an elder in the church who will explain it and pray for you. And more importantly, ask God to do it for you. God's purpose in baptizing you with the Spirit is to empower you to do his work. Paul explains what God gave him to do. In Romans it says, he gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. John Piper put it like this, Paul's aim was to produce fruit in the Gentiles. Paul is not merely aiming to convert unbelievers, he is aiming to make people sanctified, obedient to Christ. Number five, we flee from all sexual immorality, which is so destructive and can sadly destroy lives. Paul reminds us that we are temples of the Holy Spirit, so we are to keep our bodies for holy use. The phrase he uses is a living sacrifice. Number six, we must trust God and obey. We must trust God who will work in us, but also obey him. Paul writes, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. You see here, Paul says to obey, but also that God works in us, which is the trust part. So our Christian walk is not one of performance. When we strive for holiness, we also trust that God will do it. Here are some other quick things that we should be doing. We should seek advice and counsel from older, wiser people. We should study God's word. We should pray and listen to the Holy Spirit, and we should worship. Can you think of any more ways we can cooperate with God for our sanctification? Have a think. Here's some final points to consider. We are motivated to holiness because we love him and he loves us. And we are motivated because God's ultimate purpose for the church is to be a perfect spotless bride, united with Christ for his glory. The church is the bride of Christ. Have a look at some of these scriptures. God is waiting for us and he is jealous and grieved when we drift away or sin. The Bible describes our unfaithfulness like a wife becoming a prostitute, but God accepting her back with forgiveness because of his love for her. Again, look at these scriptures. And finally, here's a question. Can you think of any other motivations for your sanctification in your life? Thank you.